Good evening and welcome to the Wednesday, January 25th public board meeting of the Halton District School Board. I'd like to welcome everyone, including those in the audience. Thank you for coming and uh, welcome to all those at home who are watching us. I'd like to uh, remind everyone that uh, if you could turn off anything that makes noise, it would be greatly appreciated. I'd like to acknowledge um, regrets from Trustee Pappen, Trustee Harvey Hope, and Trustee Hajali. And I'd like to uh, mention that the Halton District School Board acknowledges and thanks the First Peoples of this territory and other Indigenous peoples for the use of this land in order for us to continue our work today. I also like to remind everyone that we are video voice recorded and being live streamed out to the web. So wave to your friends and family who are watching. So um, I'd like to call for approval of the agenda. Could I have a motion to approve the agenda tonight, please? <coughs> Moved by Trustee Reynolds, seconded by Trustee Gray. Is there any discussion on approving tonight's agenda? Seeing none, all those in favor. And that passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Do we have any declarations of conflict of interest tonight? Seeing none, we have no presentations or delegations. So we will move on to the minutes of the regular board meeting from January 11th, 2017. Can I have a motion to approve the minutes? Moved by Trustee Grabent, seconded by Trustee Oliver. Is there any discussion on the minutes from January 11th? Seeing none. All those in favor. Trustee Grabenz. Thank you, that passes unanimously. So we're now up to approval of any business transacted in private session. Did we have anything for approval in private session? Yes, I have one item. Be it resolved that the Halton District School Board reappoint Mary Caputi, CPA, CA, to the position of non-board member, public representative, audit committee. Be it resolved that the Halton District School Board approve the term of reappointment for Mary Caputi to be effective January 1st, 2017 to December 31st, 2019. Be it resolved that the Halton District School Board appoint Daniel McCarroll, CPA, CMA, to the position of non-board member, public representative, audit committee. Be it resolved that the Halton District School Board approve the term of the appointment for Daniel McCarroll to be effective February 1st, 2017 to December 31st, 2020. And I so move. Thank you. Seconded by Trustee Gray. Is there any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor. And that carries unanimously. So congratulations to Mary and Daniel for their appointments on the audit committee. <coughs> Our next item is the order paper. Is there any discussion on the order paper tonight? Seeing none, moving right along, we are we have no action items tonight. So we'll move on to one of the highlights, our student trustee reports. Uh, trustee Metropolanski. Uh, so first of all, um, my code student trustee aide, he sends his regrets. He's studying for exams. I believe he has an exam today after school, uh, so he couldn't be here today. Um, in terms of what we've been up to, the first thing is that we had a meeting with Stuart and Gail about the student trustee um, election policy. Um, we're looking to revise that. Uh, particularly, we're discussing now whether or not that should um, 
we should use um, electronic forms of voting or if we can look at streaming um, the speeches in any way. Um, the purpose of this discussion is to see if we can broaden um, the number of people who can participate in the voting process, whether it's running as a student trustee or even just being able to uh, vote for a candidate. Um, and the, f the physical barrier in terms of actually having to come to the boardroom to be here to see all the speeches is something that's a barrier for a lot of students, so we're looking at that. Um, there are issues, however, so it would be something that we haven't done recently. There's new technology involved. Um, so I've actually asked some student trustees, well, I've posed the question to a lot of the student trustees at Austin ACO uh, in terms of who's done it at their boards, who has this electronic form of voting. And I've only gotten a response from one board. I only know of one board that does it, uh, the York board. And they don't even do it the full um, electronic voting way. They still have in-person voting. Um, so there are obviously complications, and we're still working on it, and we're talking about it, and we'll probably have another meeting. Um, the second thing is, uh, last time I mentioned that for the Halton Youth Leadership Symposium, we were looking at a date in April, um, and there were concerns for that because there might be another conference um, overlapping with that because there are other educational conferences or initiatives in April. Um, before that, we wanted to do it in May, and we're now reconsidering May. The reason being that most of the volunteers that we get for the the conference are secondary students, um, so our secondary senate uh, senators. Um, and in early May, there are AP exams and IB exams, so we were thinking that if we did it in mid-May or late May, um, there would be more students who would just be free to help, versus in April, everyone's starting to focus on exams if you have those exams at the beginning of May. So what we're now looking uh, for is uh, like May 19th, that's a specific date that we've talked about with Sheridan, um, and I can be in touch with Gail or anyone else about that if there's a conflict with that. We haven't set the date yet or booked it, um, but that's what we're looking at now. Um, the third thing is in terms of for Austin Ego, um, tomorrow I'm actually meeting with, along with a couple of other um, student trustees who are on the executive council, we're meeting with, um, I set up a meeting with the deputy minister of the advanced education um, ministry, um, and we're going to talk about OSAP with them. So uh, not this previous uh, student senate meeting, but the meeting before we talked to our uh, senators about OSAP, which is the financial aid program for students uh, who are going into university. Um, and we asked about their thoughts for that. So we're going to be talking to the deputy minister, um, who's actually used to be president, he might still be Sheldon Levy uh, of Sheridan College, so from Halton around this region, which is super cool. Um, and we'll be talking to him about that. Um, and last thing on more of a personal note, um, I know that in our mailboxes we get the Education Today magazine um, that OPSPA puts out. I actually have an article published in that uh, that I had to write out, so it's published in the issue that just most recently um, got put out. Uh, so if you can, take the time to read that, that would be awesome. Thanks. And yeah, that's my update. Well, thank you very much, and, you, and we already knew you are going to be famous, so it's just starting early. <laughs> Uh, Director Miller wanted to say something, I believe. Uh, yeah, I just have a couple of comments about Dash's report. Uh, the first one is, uh, I haven't read the article, but I've seen it. I will read it. The next one, I think uh, you had a, it's not really a student trustee um, uh, issue, but Dash is a little humble. Um, she was at Queen's University a couple of weeks ago in debating. And how'd you do, Dasha? <laughs> Can you guess she won? <laughs> and the next one is um, uh, Dale and I met with Zaid and Dasha around the student trustee voting, and that was an initial meeting just to kind of say, here's the issue, take the student senate. Um, I'd be looking at the second meeting where we actually make decisions to involve the trustee mentors, Donna and, and uh, trustee um, Daniele and trustee Pappen, because then we'll be getting down to the brass tacks. So, uh, once you're ready, Dasha, you give us the dates and we'll set the dates. Thank you. Is there any comments or questions for uh, Trustee Metropolanski? Seeing none, well, thank you very much for your report. Sounds like there's still lots going on and, uh, and it's an exciting time. And congratulations on all your successes. All right, moving on, we're up to um, is there any notices of motion tonight? Seeing none, we'll move on to our action items for February the 1st. The first is redirection of students in Alton West. Superintendent Blackwell, report 17008 on page 15 of your board package.
Welcome, Superintendent Blackwell, accompanied by Superintendent Ito. When you're ready. And we also have uh, General Manager Dom Ranzella kind of on the wings in case we have any questions for him. Um, so in your package, um, you should have uh, a copy of the, the report. Um, tonight I'm going to go through these bullets. So we're going to talk about the reason for this review, the current boundaries. We're going to talk about how it connects with our long-term accommodation pan, uh, sorry, plan, uh, the boundary review process, and it's a little different uh, given the conditions here, uh, the criteria and options, and then uh, we'll leave you with a recommended option to consider for next week, February 1st. So why a boundary review? And this is the redirection of um, the area that is north of Dundas, west of Walker's Line. Uh, it's, called, it's referred to as Thundile Development at this point. Uh, we need to ensure that uh, as a board we're prudent in advising families and, and those that are purchasing land in that area, uh, which schools they will be directed to. And as you know, we have a current issue with uh, Dr. Frank J. Hayden Secondary School in that we are over capacity now and will continue to be over capacity for the next 10 years in the current status. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. Uh, these are the current boundaries based on the initial development. And again, this, this process is to uh, redirect the students that live in this area uh, and I'll talk about the criteria that we're going to use. So as in our long-term accommodation plan, uh, we did identify last year that uh, the, in the secondary review area 101, which is where Hayden resides, uh, it's currently over capacity and as I mentioned, it will continue to be over the next 10 years. Here are some numbers for you. Um, as of November 1st, uh, we are at approximately 130% capacity at Hayden. There are 12 per, uh, portables permitted on Hayden and we have 12 portables. There is no room to grow. Um, and the, the percentages, as you can see in the, in the final row, uh, continue to increase. So adding more students uh, from this development would be problematic. Uh, in terms of our boundary review process, <coughs> administrative procedure, uh, we have two consultation pathways and we have, this is a unique situation because currently there are no uh, residents within this triangle. As well, this boundary review uh, is not redirecting students that are existing in Halton in any of our schools. So this is why this pathway is chosen. Uh, there's a timeline there that we followed and as I mentioned, the recommendation uh, will occur on February 1st. Uh, sorry, the recommendation is coming to the board tonight for a decision on February 1st. Just if for some context, th these are the schools that uh, were identified in our eight options of elementary schools that we looked at and the feeding secondary schools. Now we acknowledge there's a program and accommodation review process involving Burlington High Schools right now. Uh, this process is undertaken and the recommendation that we're, that we're putting forward tonight is based on the board's current state and configuration of schools. So I just wanted to clarify that in terms of how it, the, they, they are related. Um, one of the things as well as we talk about some of the options coming forward that's important to know is Rolling Meadows is a unique school on our board. It has English K to 6 and then in grade 7 and 8 it's French immersion. So keep that in mind as we're going through some of the, the options. Um, as I mentioned, we started with uh, eight elementary options, the committee, the Boundary Review Steering Committee, um, and their two feeder high schools. We then, as a process piece, as identified in our admin procedure, looked at the criteria and we prioritized our criteria. And our criteria involved keeping cohorts together, a balance of overall enrollments, uh, looking at viable numbers to support both English and French program, stable long-term boundaries, and of course, fiscal responsibility. We did look at the other criteria that is in our AP and our admin procedure. These were the, the key criteria that we started with and, and we were able to very quickly using this criteria, reduce uh, the eight elementary scenarios down to three. 
It's important as well to note that any elementary student in this area will be bused. The current status as well as any of the options and, and that information is provided to us by Halton uh, Student Transportation Services. Um, the area is a busy area, Dundas and Walkers, and uh, all of the, regardless of the option and regardless of the current state, these would be bus students. So this is the first option of the three that we uh, looked at to put forward this recommendation. As you'll see in option one, the English program pathway um, looks at two schools, Brant Hills, M.M. Robinson, and then the French Immersion Program Pathway looks at Bruce T. Lindley. As I mentioned, Bruce T. Lindley, it does go to grade six only, so they would then need to move to Rolling Meadows for seven and eight and then continue to MMR. This is another way of looking at it. The way you would look at this chart is to read it vertically. So it, kind, it does highlight the number of schools that a student would attend. So if I'm in an English program pathway, I, might, I will be attending two schools, K to 12. If I am in a French immersion program pathway, if you look in the final column on the right, it will show that I will start in one school for kindergarten to grade one, then go to two to six, then go to seven and eight, and then go nine to 12. So in terms of a criteria that we held uh, to look at these options, the number of transitions for students uh, in the last column are, ex are numerous. And uh, it would also in, in, uh, look at, we would have to look at portables at Brant Hills. The other consideration that we talked about was the fragmentation of this community. As you saw at the very first slide, it's a triangle. It's a very uh, defined area. And we, we really wanted to make sure that the kids within that community are going to the same place. So here you could have kids going to three different schools that are the same age. Um, second option, which is very close to that option, is option five. It looks at the English program pathway being two schools. And again, it does look initially as if you're attending only three schools uh, with the French immersion program pathway when you look at the schools. But in the chart, because of our uh, grade two entry for French immersion, they start in kindergarten at Rolling Meadows, then would have to go to Clarksdale for grade two and then go back to Rolling Meadows and then go with their cohorts to MMR. So we looked at those two options and again the portable requirements and it did not balance our enrollment uh, as, which was one of our criteria and that's how we delineated um, this option from the next option. Uh, this will be, th this is the recommended option. Uh, the English program pathway and the French program pathway uh, I'm going to show it to you in a chart. It's probably easier to see. All students, kindergarten to grade six, will attend Clarksdale Public School, regardless of program. They would then move to grade seven and eight, and that should be a grade six. There's an error in that. It should be kindergarten to grade six for Clarksdale. It only goes up to grade six. Um, and then they would attend Rolling Meadows in seven and eight. So regardless of the program of study, all of the kids from that neighborhood would be together. And then they would all transfer to, to M.M. Robinson. Now some of the reasons for this decision that we ended up with and recommended to the director um, that they would attend the same school we also looked at the number of transitions and this one did provide us with the fewest number of transitions. Uh, it kept our cohorts and the community together. Uh, it did create stable long-term boundaries. Um, it really beefs up the English program as well at, at Clarksdale. It's sometimes the staffing pieces are difficult with low numbers of English and higher French. So this, this provides a nice uh, balance. The other thing is that uh, when prior to Alton Village opening, um, the students that lived in the Alton Village area did attend Rolling Meadows and Clarksdale. So the, we know the transportation pieces. We know that uh, the schools are very welcoming and have uh, that community already as part of, um, 
part of their experience uh, in terms of welcoming those communities. And we also know that we need a boundaries. Uh, we will include that effective September 2017. So it'll be able to do that uh, immediately and direct that information to families. Um, are there any questions at this time? Trustee Gavins. Oh, you bumped yourself down. Okay, sorry. Trustee Collard. I actually wanted to give um, Trustee Gravens the opportunity to go first since it's her school. But um, yes, I my question is, um, I noticed that originally uh, Lester B. Pearson was also under consideration as a secondary school, but I didn't see it in any of the three options outlined. Could you please explain to, to us um, why it was not in any of the three options? Uh, through the chair to Trustee Collard. Uh, as I mentioned, we did look at those options um, initially, and then we used that criteria, the evaluation criteria. What, uh, when we looked at some of the options in feeding into Lester B. Pearson, the number of transitions were too high uh, for students in the French Immersion Program specifically. We also looked at the accommodation pressures in terms of uh, within the um, elementary schools. So the elementary schools really dictated the decision for the high school. Thank you. Trustee Reynolds. Um, thank you. My question actually was answered. Thank you, uh, Trustee Collard. I, I believe that the community would really wanted to have seen why the Pearson um, consideration uh, wasn't spelled out. Um, I, I certainly support this uh, recommendation. Uh, I think it, it does what you, you set out to do, but I think that would be the only takeaway piece they would want to know why that, because of course, as the park is, uh, is the program accommodation review is is um, being undertaken, and I think people would just, you know, from a from a public um, um, transparency piece, they would like to understand that. Sorry, and through the chair, um, I'll just uh, reiterate: um, it, uh, we did have a, a couple of scenarios that we looked at, and those would be posted. Uh, on the website um, and and are there for for public cons uh, public consumption. Uh, the reason why they didn't uh, end up as being our final uh, considered for our final recommendation would be similar uh, to some of the reasons that um, Superintendent Blackwell uh, indicated in terms of uh, this being a, a small, somewhat isolated community. Um, uh, with very fixed boundaries, uh, we, we wanted uh, very much so uh, the steering committee to ensure that we weren't dividing up the students into too many different schools and trying to keep that sense of community. So um, uh, in the, in the um, scenarios uh, involving Lester B. Pearson and, and some of the feeder schools, we would have students going to various different schools like Clarksdale and, uh, and Rolling Meadows and, um, and, and Sir Ernest McMillan and Dr. Charles Best. And so it would very much fragment what, what is already going to be um, a relatively uh, small uh, student population being drawn from that area. Thank you. Trustee Gavins. Thank you through you, Chair Amos. Um, uh, it, I wanted to say that actually it was a it was a pleasure being part of this uh, boundary review committee. Um, I think the team worked really well together. I did. Um, uh, trustee Pappen did call me, and we had a discussion. She is the trustee for the Pearson area, and so she was uh, wanted to make sure that we uh, did give uh, the school area a due consideration. I did explain to her that um, the pathway. Uh, really diverged uh, if if students went to Dr. Charles Best, if they went to um, French Immersion, they were going then from Best to Clarksdale to Rolling Meadows to M.M. Robinson. So it already split off the um, uh, part of the cohort right uh, into M.M. Into, um, M. Robinson's area. And, um, and also it was going to add uh, portables to the Dr. Charles Best site, and I understand we had just removed portables from Dr. Charles Best. So fiscally, that would be pretty irresponsible when we had uh, the space available at the Clarksdale site with, that could accommodate the students without adding portables. Um, it, there were an, a, a, a number of reasons why we didn't go that way, but I just wanted to actually 
let the public know that uh, just because uh, Trustee Papin isn't here, she um, that she was actually um, concerned about her area and wanted to make sure that her voice was heard. Thank you. Trustee Mitch Polanski. Uh, so my understanding is that this redirection of students is distinct from the Burlington PAR process. Um, I noticed though that one of the schools involved, M.M. Robinson, is also involved in the Burlington PAR process. So my question is, does this affect, does this redirection affect that process in any way? The decision that's being made on this has no, uh, is not a consideration of what's happening with the PAR. We're making it based on today in our schools this is what we have and based on our criteria number of transitions cohort staying together now indirectly it will inform it will provide more information to the burlington par process um, effective september of 2017 this would mean that high school students would go to mm robinson did i answer your question okay thank you Trustee Daniel. Thanks. I just, I just wanted to follow up, if, um, if I may, for that, because I, I, I'm sure that there, there might be some, there might be some speculation that we, we've uh, jumped the gun a little bit in, in terms of filling one of the schools that might be under consideration for closure during the par. But I assume that this needs to be done at this point in time with the current boundaries in place, regardless <coughs> of the par, because of staffing issues, that that is one of the uh, timing pressures that we're on. And if so, could you please uh, um, elaborate on that for us? Sure. Through the chair to uh, Trustee Daniele, staffing is definitely part of uh, the informing piece. At the peak of enrollment for this area, there will be approximately, based on our projections from planning, 42 secondary students spread across programs and grades. Um, and given, as, as I discussed earlier, given that we have 12 portables permitted at Hayden and they are uh, filled, uh, w the school is, is busy. We do not have any room at the end, so to speak. There is no room to add additional students. So that's why we're redirecting at this point. Uh, in terms of the staffing, 42 students uh, at peak uh, would impact staffing possibly, based maybe sec six sections, a teacher. Um, it depends how it's spread out. Go ahead, Director Milley. Through Chair Amos to Trustee Daniele. In addition, these houses will be closed in September, uh, or, or the summer. Summer. And uh, if we had not undertaken this, this boundary review, people would have been buying these houses not knowing whether students were going to go to secondary school. So it's staffing and it's to allow the, uh, families to know where their, where their children will go to school. Thank you for that clarification around the timing. Thank you. And if I could just follow up with that. Go ahead. Uh, and through the chair to Trustee Daniele, um, as you mentioned in the staffing piece, by having this decision in February, by February 1st, it provides not only information to the PAR, committee. It also uh, provides staffing information which is needed for the beginning of March. Okay. Thank you. And seeing no further questions, I'd like to thank you very much for your report. Um, and I know that we look forward to having it come back next week. Thank you. And I'd like to thank uh, and acknowledge the work of uh, the committee, including Trustee Grabentz and Trustee L. Harrison, as well as uh, General Manager Don Ranzella and Planning Department. Thank you very much. So our next item is Respectful Workplace Policy Feedback. So, uh, Director Miller, uh, Report 17012 on page 24 of your board package. Director Miller. Thank you, Chair Amos. Uh, the report's in front of you, and we had, uh, this has been out in the public for uh, um, the required period of no less than 25 days, and we've had no comments uh, provided to us. Thank you. Is there any comments or questions regarding this for the director? Seeing none, thank you very much for your report. Our next item is the Policy Review Annual Report, Director Miller Report 17011 on page 26 of your board package. Director Miller. 
Thank you, Chair Amos. To all trustees, this is uh, a report that sh that uh, needs to come annually, and it's a review of our policies. As you are aware, we have been reviewing all our admin procedures, and we bring them um, every second board meeting. I think we bring updated ones. Um, with this policy review, um, staff will do, do the initial work, but all changes will go through the Board of Trustees. Thank you. Is there any comments or questions for the director on this report? Seeing none, we'll keep moving. On to the next item, which is input redelegation bylaw. Uh, trustee Collar, Trustee Grabentz, Trust, uh, Vice Chair Graves, Report 17013 on page 57 of your board package. Uh, trustee Collar. Thank you. Uh, it's um, with great pleasure that I bring this amendment to our delegation bylaw before the Board of Trustees for posting on our website. And we have worked for about three or four months on this bylaw to make it more transparent, give uh, the public greater opportunities to be welcomed at our board table to give us their ideas, their considerations, their concerns regarding um, motions that are coming before the board. And um, we are very uh, pleased to be making this a more welcoming process for them. Um, I would like to suggest that the rules should be waived so that this can be posted to the website immediately, um, giving the public two weeks to um, make comment before it is brought back to the Committee of the Whole. Thanks. Uh, thank you. So I. I heard a motion to waive the rules. Do I have a seconder to waive the rules? Trustee Gervantz. Is there any discussion on waiving the rules? Seeing none, I will read the motion or put the uh, motion on the floor to waive the rules. To deal with the posting of the delegation bylaw. All those in favor? And that passes unanimously. Thank you. So I'll put the motion on the floor. Be it resolved, the Halton District School Board's de delegation bylaw as appended to report 17013 be posted on the board's website for public input until. February 7th, 2017, and any input returned to the Committee of the Whole for consideration on February the 8th, 2017. Moved by Trustee Collard, seconded by Trustee Gravens. Any discussion on the motion? Trustee Reynolds. Um, Thank you, through the chair. I'd just like to echo uh, the comments from uh, Trustee Collard. I'm in full support of this motion, motion and just grateful to the trustees for continuing to move this work forward. Um, I'm happy it's going to be posted um, to obtain public's input since its intent is to provide a more user-friendly and online process. And there are three reasons why I support it. Um, now that the, if the public is interested in making a delegation, they'll have the ability to review the agenda and the pa board package in advance of making the request to address the board publicly. Um, they'll be able to speak directly to an issue and have more time rather than the original seven day timeline that our, our, our current policy has. Um, the addition of uh, allowing trustee questions of five minutes uh, certainly will allow for further clarification. Um, the fact that uh, prepared written transcripts will no longer be required, but the um, application process finally allows presenters the freedom to express themselves without adhering to strict written materials uh, previously submitted and reviewed by the chair. So, thank you. Thank you. Trust Vice Chair Graves. Thank you very much. I, I echo all of uh, Trustee Reynolds' comments and. Uh, been waiting a long time for this to uh, to come to the board, so I'm I'm glad it is uh, finally here. Uh, however, I, I think in our um, our haste these these past few weeks, I, I use that term lately. I know we've spent a lot of time on this. Um, 
but there, there's one section that just uh, has me a little bit concerned, and that's about, um, uh, I know we're, this is proposing to change the length of time to five minutes plus up to five minutes of questions, which I think is great, uh, and I'm fully supportive of it, uh, but I realized uh, after our last committee the whole meeting that this would mean that delegation nights could be, I calculated exactly, I believe four hours and 10 minutes long. Uh, so I wonder if the group might entertain in section 11 on the the middle line after the back of the bracket where it says the chair or vice chair as applicable will uh, open for, I wonder if we could strike will and replace it with may so that um, uh, that gives gives the option to to have our delegation nights be um, a little more compact, but um, I, that do, it is it is a change. So I'll I'll leave that sort of on the floor just with that that idea. Um, I believe there is also um, the. Pot the potential for trustees to provide feedback while it's out for the two weeks. So when it comes back to the committee of the whole, um, it can um, then um, that feedback can be incorporated as well. So, um, so can I follow up? Go ahead. Uh, yeah, the question is, do we send it to the public with a will? Or do we send it with May? Because I, I would hate to do a switch after the public consultation with them not knowing that that would be a consideration. Um, you'll have to go back on the list. Oh, okay, go ahead. Um, yes, uh, I, I would prefer to post it as is because that was what trustees agreed and voted to post. Um, changes afterwards, like on the fly, we might decide that that's not what we want to do and then we've posted May instead of Will. And so we might change it back or we might say, well, on special delegation, delegation nights, we'll have a different rule. We, there are any number of ways we could go with that. So I would prefer to post it the way it is and let the public tell us what they think. As well as trustees, they can provide feedback. Yes, absolutely. Well, it, this is coming back to committee as a whole. So there is ample opportunity for us to make changes um, as required um, at that point. Trustee events. Through you, Chair Amos, I just wanted to say that um, I'm really glad that this is going out to the public. We, just so the public knows, we don't actually have to do this. It's not a policy, it's a bylaw. So we are seeking your input for all of you out there that are listening. So please take some time and go through it and see if there are changes that uh, you feel should happen. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you. And seeing no further speakers. All those in favor of posting the uh, draft delegation bylaw as is. And that passes unanimously. Thank you very much. So I believe that will go up tomorrow. tomorrow. Thank you. Our next item is for information for the January 20 for, tw for tonight. Sorry. <laughs> what day is it? Uh, it's the EDC bylaw amendment 2017. Yeah. Superintendent Veerman yeah. and General Manager Renzella report 17010 on page 61 of your board package. Welcome, yeah. Superintendent Veerman and uh, Ge uh, oh. General Manager Renzella, who's now injured. <laughs> and thank you. Through the chair, I'll ask uh, Mr. Renzella to speak to the report. 
Thank you, Lucy. Um, I'm, uh, the report uh, before this evening is an information report just advising trustees that we will be moving forward with an EDC uh, bylaw amendment uh, this year. Um, if you recall, um, we, our original bylaw was passed in, in 2013. We had an amendment in 2014 as well as 2015. Uh, the 2015 amendment was appealed to the Ontario Municipal Board we had a mediation uh, that occurred uh, late last year, early, early in 2016, uh, and as part of that mediation, and a settlement agreement was reached, and more or less, they, uh, the agreement resulted in us agreeing to, the, uh, to not having an amendment prior to December 1st of this year, of, of 2016. Uh, so we are now moving forward with that amendment. Uh, we hope to have something in April, early May. Again, the purpose of this is again to advise trustees that we're moving forward with this annual amendment, but moreover also to advise the development community that we are engaging uh, and moving forward with the amend amendment as well. And as, uh, as per the attachment of uh, uh, Brad Teichman's letter, uh, you know, he will be contacting Build along with our consultant to just advise them that it's coming forward. I'd be glad to answer any other questions. Thank you. Trustee L. Harrison. Thank you, through you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you for this report and the information contained in it. Um, I'm just looking at the notification requirement uh, and build and other, the development community and municipalities are, are listed. Do we, as a normal course of action, also take out a public ad in the paper? I can't recall. I believe we do. And, and maybe just to clarify, we do it especially because we have to have a public, we have a public meeting and there's notification of what the charge is going to be. So that's all part of that process leading up to the amendment being adopted. Thank you. That's what I thought. I just didn't see it in here, but thanks. Uh, thank you. I see no further speakers. So thank you very much for the notification. We will look forward to seeing you in June for the earlier. Um, given that there is a percolating park pr process and recommendations, we're really trying to advance this process, hopefully to avoid any conflict with the ongoing park process. So we're looking at maybe April, early May, again, trying to, but We'll, we'll see what, what occurs, but uh, we're trying to avoid that uh, potential conflict and, and try to minimize the, uh, the reports that on a board meeting in May and June. Okay, great. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for the report. So our next item is the budget schedule, Superintendent Bierman, report 17014 on page 67 of your board package. Superintendent Thank Bierman. you, um, through the chair. The report uh, highlights uh, various sections with respect to considerations for budget development. Can't believe I'm saying that already for next year. Uh, I provided uh, some information with respect to provincially, what is happening provincially that may impact the budget, uh, specifically the economic statement that was shared in November also provided some details with respect to the consultation that the Ministry of Education has um, undergone. And I have, again, attached the, the specific document that uh, the Ministry did look for consultation on. And also uh, responses that, uh, that were presented to, uh, to the Ministry in, um, in respect of that consultation. From the board perspective, uh, certainly the multi-year plan, the operational plan that has been recently approved, by, been approved by the trustees does and will guide budget development as we go forward. So initiatives, uh, goals and targets that have been included in the uh, both plans will um, form the basis for discussions with respect to budget. Um, as we have reported at prior meetings, uh, the implementation of the uh, Provincial Employee Life and Health Trusts are still an area that uh, 
remains a little bit of uh, uncertainty in terms of the specifics impa specific impact for the board. The waves have started in terms of transitioning some of our employee groups to the trust. The intent is that uh, all will be uh, transitioned by August 31st, 2017. As we reported as part of the revised estimates update, the ministry has and is providing funding with respect to that transition. Uh, as we continue to get details and additional information from the ministry with respect to the impact of that, we will continue to update the board. But that's certainly one area that we will pay particular attention as we continue with the development and what the potential impact will be for the board. Um, again, another area that will impact us is enrollment. <laughs> And uh, we are still projecting a small increase, but uh, being one of the few growth boards in the province that does certainly provide benefits and challenges uh, as it relates to, to accommodation. Similar to what we have done in prior years, very highlighted draft of what the timelines may be. Certainly uh, as part of uh, the process, um, uh, Mr. Renzello's department is looking at projections since that forms uh, the initial uh, point uh, of action with respect to budget, what the projections will be and how that translates into additional funding. Uh, to, uh, usually uh, the ministry provides funding details at the end of March and until we have those specifics it really is um, a little bit of uncertainty as to how it will impact, uh, impact the board. Again going back to enrollment projections that will determine staffing needs for the coming year and uh, what that will mean in terms of expenditures. So although um, we are certainly starting the planning process, the real uh, um, important piece for us is with respect to funding and how that is going to impact the board. So again, very tentative schedule as we continue uh, with, um, uh, with gathering this additional, additional information. There'll be uh, uh, meetings and workshops that will uh, again guide some of the discussion. So at this point, I'd be pleased to answer any questions. Thank you. Are there any questions for Superintendent Jeremy Smith? Uh, um, I have one. Based on um, your timeline, is that the same kind of timeline as what we have done in the past so that if we go forward with some workshops for trustee budget meetings, it'll be the same type of um, timeline as what we've done in the past couple of years? At this point, unless there's any specific uh, uh, need to change or any additional um, information that needs to be discussed, uh, we're proposing similar timelines. Again, a lot of it will depend on information as it comes forward, but whatever the wish of the group is with respect to information, whether it's budget workshops or at the Committee of the Whole, whatever is best, and perhaps uh, discussions with the Chair and Vice Chair and the Chair of the Finance Accountability Committee uh, will, will guide that. Okay, thank you. And I see no further questions at this time, so thank you very much for your information. So the next item is reporting alignment for sustainability officer, Director Miller report 17009 on page 124 of your board package, Director Miller. Thanks, Chair Amos. Uh, this report is um, um, really an information item. Since October 2010, we've had a sustainability officer in this board, and uh, part of the rationale f in that position, well, the rationale was pretty clear. W we wanted to be good stewards of the resources and good environmental uh, uh, environmental leaders. And um, when when it was brought to board, the report discussed all those things, and it was also that this sustainability officer would advise, help, and and uh, direct staff, not directly direct staff, but with advice and so on, around good environmental practices. And it was our belief at the time that uh, the sustainability officer in, would, would create a, a scenario in which either um, saved the board a great deal of money and or uh, prevented additional funds being spent around environmental stuff. Although we don't have the figures because we haven't done it for some time, but the first few years, first couple of years, we reported that, in fact, it did do that. Um, at that time, to 
to demonstrate or model the significance of that we believed in that position and the Board of Trustees, and in fact, particularly the Board of Trustees believed around that position, the sustainability officer reported to the Director of Education. <laughs> that position is now totally ensconced in our board and there's no question around their abilities and their authorities and, and the need to report to the director is no longer there, I would say, in terms of uh, symbolism and or their work. And I would also say that it's, it's difficult for the director to, because it would be the only non-senior person that would be doing it. So this report is really saying that the sustainability officer will now report to uh, uh, Superintendent Cullen. Um, now, having said that, a big part of their job is facilities, maintenance, all that, but they've also b provided great support around our schools with eco-schools and helping teachers and the IPLs and the program department, both elementary and secondary around that. That will continue. So although they will report to uh, facilities, they will also, uh, this person, Suzanne Burwell, who has done a fantastic job for us, by the way, uh, will continue to do many of her school roles as well. Um, one of the challenges is we've had is uh, th this will also increase the capacity of our schools because Suzanne's been doing a lot of it when other people can do it. So, uh, any questions? Are there any comments or questions for the director on his report tonight? Trustee Collard. I've had the pleasure of working with Ms. Burwell for a number of years and um, the, the work that she has done on behalf of our board to create a more environmentally sustainable as well as fiscally responsible um, way for us to conduct our business has been um, a, a great benefit to us. I'm very pleased to see that um, this realignment is occurring and, I, and I'm very pleased uh, with the report. Thank you. Thank you. I just will have a final comment. Because of the work Suzanne's done last fall, fall of uh, 2015, I was a, a keynote speaker at a, a, an environmental eco schools conference at York University, and uh, it was uh, it was great pleasure speaking. But what was apparent when I was at that meeting was that the Halton Board is leaps ahead of many many other boards in this province on environmental sustainability and. Uh, the things that we've enacted. And that's a direct result of Suzanne's work. There's no question about it, so. Thank you. And seeing no further speakers to this topic, thank you very much for your report. So the next item is the board report schedule, Director Miller, report 17016 on page 125 of your board package. Director Miller. Thank you, Chair Amos. Um, there's a few changes. Uh, la at the last board meeting, it was brought to our attention that May 17th was going to be a very heavy meeting. Uh, but there's a, there's a change. Uh, I'll talk about the change in a second, but I'll just update some of the, the um, conversations. At the next board meeting on February 1st, uh, Superintendent uh, Zonnefeld will be giving a verbal update on the special education review. Um, and then the report itself will come March 1st, the first board meeting in March for information. But he will give a verbal update, um, probably during the director's report at the next uh, uh, board meeting on February 1st. We, um, we did address the May 17th, and as you can see, we, we pulled some items out of that date. Um, We've left budget there along with PAR at this point. We suspect we may have to do some more adjustments as we go further. And we're actually going to change the format a, a wee bit now. If you look on the back of that chart there where it's got there, we've got a few inconsistencies that we've found. The boundary review study for Martin Street says February 15th. Um, that's when it will first appear in front of the board for... Uh, and then the vote would be March 1st. But if we go down to the Burlington Par, it says May 17th. That's when the vote would occur. So the first time it should appear to the board is May 3rd. And then May 17th would be the vote. So um, uh, the, oh, I was going to say manager. <laughs> manager Dortmaker uh, and I have just discussed this. 
And we're going to include both dates from now on. We're going to update this and include both dates so you see when it arrives and when the vote is on there for all those action items. And um, um, so that the, the, the public can see it because it could be a little confusing for them because it certainly was confusing for me. Um, and uh, the only other changes is uh, June 7th, we moved some of the stuff out on May 17th, the Community Partnership Report and the Center for Skills and Training Report. And as I said, uh, we've left a couple of biggies on May 17th. We may have to do an adjustment later on, but we'll, we'll, we'll see. We'll, we'll kind of play it a little bit by, by year for that. So, uh, because even the Burlington Par, we're just really entering the public consultation phase now you know, the, the, there may be some delay in getting that report or, or something like that. So uh, I'll take any questions. Thank you very much. Are there any comments or questions about the schedule for the director? Seeing none, thank you very much for your report. So we're now up to committee reports. Do we have any committee reports tonight? Trustee Oliver. Thank you, through you, Chair. As a trustee representative on the Special Education um, Review Steering Committee, I'd like to provide you with just a quick um, update of, of some of the work that has taken um, place to date. A number of milestones have been reached and uh, some activities still continue. And these include an ongoing literature review, the analysis of student profile data, so looking at the proportion of students by exceptionality, and comparing our data to the provincial data as well as our uh, comparator um, school boards. We've also looked at achievement data by exceptionality, and there were a number of focus groups conduct conducted with uh, various um, staff groups, including administrators, um, Special, res uh, special education resource teachers, um, EAs will be included in, in the focus groups, and student service staff. There's also a parent survey that is uh, going out to every parent and guardian of a child who has an individual education um, plan to gather their feedback and perspective on the development of the IEP, how it's playing out, their general satisfaction, et cetera. And a similar survey will then go out to every student with an IEP to, to gather student uh, input. And then, of course, uh, uh, the budget um, analysis will take place as well. So as you can see, there's a lot going on and uh, a lot of different data sources are being considered and a full picture is being created so that uh, some recommendations can be put forward. And I'll leave it at that and I'll let uh, Superintendent Zonabelt provide some more details at our next uh, board meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Trustee Reynolds. <clears throat> Excuse me, thank you. Um, I will give the Special Education Advisory Committee report on behalf of our trustees who sit at that committee. Um, our last meeting was held in Milton at the Milton Staff Learning Center. Uh, it was nice to see um, public actually support and attend the meeting up there. Um, and uh, a couple of things that were discussed uh, the director had um, done a presentation on the uh, upcoming Burlington PAR um, and um, uh, answered questions um, from SEAC and um, invited SEAC to uh, provide input um, and SEAC decided that uh, as a group they will, they will uh, consolidate their, their comments and concerns um, regarding uh, uh, making changes to student education uh, with students with special ed education needs. Um, and the director reminded uh, SIAC that he is again willing to meet with uh, individuals and groups to talk uh, individually should, should there be some c other concerns. Uh, we had lots of work that was uh, being requested of us, um, the spec ed plan uh, revisions uh, and uh, um, on behalf of uh, Trustee Pappen, um, a request for uh, feedback for the accessibility plan. So lots of work um, going forward and uh, potentially the next CF meeting may have a change, I understand. So that would be, um, that, that would be it, thanks. Thank you. Uh, it won't, sorry, it won't be the next day, it'll be two days from now that we may change, right? 
sorry, I didn't hear that. What? So it won't be, it won't be the next meeting that will change. Will be two meetings from now, That's right? Correct. As we discussed. Yeah. Uh, Vice Chair Graves. So, quick update on our last committee of the whole meeting. We did our committee chair and vice chair elections, yeah. and we had a an excellent safe use of technology and technology update presentation, which is very informative for all of us. And um, we brought the, um, what, I, what I continue to call the Burlington Triangle, the Alton Village Boundary Review um, uh, information session there as well for, um, uh, for it to go earlier to public consumption uh, in light of the fact that we have two uh, board meetings back to back. Uh, so, and then of course we did our, uh, our excellent work on our delegation bylaw. Uh, so, uh, you know, we have no committee of the whole meeting next week. Uh, of course it's a board meeting. So I'll be asking all of the, uh, the chairs and vice chairs to come together, uh, to make some planning for, uh, for the meetings starting in February and beyond. Thank you. Thank you. And seeing no further speakers on committee reports, thank you very much everyone for your reports tonight. So we're now up to the director's report. Thank you, Chair Amos. Um, I've got uh, two or three items here. The first item is um, to say publicly we will be putting messaging out as of tomorrow around this. But the uh, as we're into the Burlington PAR process, and in fact the first park meeting, uh, working meeting is meeting is tomorrow uh, here I think seven o'clock I believe is when it starts uh, there'll be three meetings then there'll be another public meeting right now we have two public meetings they're scheduled February 28th and March 2nd uh, February 28th is at Hayden March 2nd is at at uh, New Street however the March 2nd meeting has been changed to March 7th. March 7th, the following Tuesday, and that would be at New Street, and we uh, are putting messaging out, and we'll put reminders out about that, and we'll make sure that the community's aware. Uh, hence, that may mean that uh, SEAC may be moving there. It's likely that SEAC will move their meeting, which is scheduled on the same evening, uh, but Superintendent Zonnefeld will get that date out to uh, any public that wants to attend to that meeting and so on. Um, it's also important to note for the Burlington PAR and the Burlington community that on February 27th, a day before the first public meeting, there'll be a consultation document going out to the community and the residents of Burlington uh, that uh, Ipsos Reed has developed and that would be going in and it would close uh, March the 10th, which so that's two full weeks for uh, the, the community to weigh in. And then uh, they will present that information at the final park meeting, which is March 23rd. But just a reminder that the date has changed from March 2nd to March 7th. And again, we'll get lots of uh, information out there. So I don't know if there's any questions about that before I go on to the next item. No? I see no speakers. Okay. Uh, the second one is a very good news story. And I'm going to re refer to uh, Superintendent uh, Pogberg. Thank you, Director Miller. Um, uh, just uh, an update on, um, we have some very good news from the Ministry of Education around a funding announcement, capital funding for, um, uh, they call it an OEYCFC, which is an earlier center and family center in Oakwood. School has been approved, so it, it's uh, over $700,000 to do retrofit. In other words, this fills up space uh, within Oakwood. Um, and OEYCFC offers a variety of services. It's pre, prenatal family support, really geared to young, young families. Um, there's a core set of services that's run by, uh, through the region of Halton, um, and they have an operator in Oakville. It's the Oakville Parent Child Center who, who runs these uh, centers. And um, it, it will be a real, it's a real asset to the community. It's a real community support. Um, we're very supportive of these being co-located in elementary schools. Um, there's just real benefits to that. And uh, there's a lot of um, provincial dialogue around that. And they're starting to now fund the idea, which is uh, 
great news all around. That is great news. Through Chair Amos, just to add to that, we, uh, we're, we're very grateful to the ministry. They had hundreds of requests, I think up to almost 300 requests for this kind of funding. So we feel fortunate that uh, Oakwood was selected by the ministry to be uh, a place in Halton that that can be, and we hope that's the beginning, not the, uh, not the end of other choices. But uh, uh, the ministry clearly had some difficult decisions to make, and uh, we're, we're pleased that they made a good one for us. So thank you. Trustee O'Harrison. Thank you very much. It's not much of a question. It's just also an expression of gratitude to staff that have worked on this and, and to the ministry. Uh, Oakwood couldn't be a more deserving community for this uh, type of facility. There's so many good things happening at Oakwood over the last couple of years, and I think this will just continue the momentum uh, in that community in support of the kids and their families. So thanks. Do you have anything else, Director Mayer? Uh, to all trustees, I'm going to refer to Superintendent uh, Trufin. Um, we had a, a, an incident on Monday involving uh, technology that appeared on the CTV news, so I think the public needs to hear how we dealt with that. Um, so I'm going to refer to Superintendent Trufin. Uh, thank you, Director Miller, and, and to the trustees. Uh, we did get a report actually last week, and it was reported on the news uh, on Monday. Um, to let the trustees know, myself and my department is doing an investigation on user ID IP addresses to see if in any way uh, our internet filter, uh, our subscription, the vendor that we use, failed in any way. So we are doing an investigation, um, and uh, hopefully we'll I'll have a report at a later time for you, but uh, we are investigating as a department to look at uh, user IDs and logins to make sure our filter does the job it's supposed to do. Thank you. I see no speakers to that. We can continue. Okay. Um, we sleek it, cowering, timorous beastie. Oh, what a panic's in thy breastie. Thou needn't a start a wasa hasty with bicker and brattle. I would be laid to rin and chase thee with murder and prattle. I'll translate for you. <laughs> we, cra <laughs> we crafty, cowering, timid little beast. Oh, what a panic is in your little breast. You need not start away so hasty with argumentative chatter. I would be loath to run and chase you with murder and plow. And that is the opening verse in a Robert Burns poem, because it's Robert bon Burns Day. <laughs> Happy Robert Burns, Robbie Burns Day, and uh, your uh, accent came before. <laughs> we have some other traditions that are inappropriate in the public setting, though. <laughs> and is that the end of your report? That's the end of my report. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, communications from the chair. Um, I don't have any at this time, uh, so we're up to trustee questions and comments. Do we have any trustee questions and comments tonight? Trustee Cullen. Yes, um, I received an email from one of my elementary schools today explaining the changes to the French immersion program. And I was wondering if that is something that will be going out from each of our schools explaining the change because it was very well written. I was very pleased with, uh, with all of the information that they managed to fit on the one page. It explains it very well. And I, I would just wanted to commend staff um, for putting that together. I was really, really happy with it. Uh, Superintendent Etoff. Yes, through the chair to Trustee Collard. Um, yes, that's a piece that uh, that we've put together and we've, we've individualized uh, okay. for each of our schools. Um, we thought initially we would just have a few different letters to write and at the end of the day we realized we have about 16 different school configurations in our board. Um, and we tailored, um, uh, of course, a lot of the information um, is, is general information, but certainly the bottom portion of the letter was sp specific to that audience at that school. And that's, I, I know I've spoken about this before, 
our communications philosophy going forward is is really trying to to tailor communications and, and work with our schools to assist them and being uh, them being the primary uh, vehicle of, of connecting with their communities not necessarily it, it being sent out from the Halton District School Board but from their local schools we, we assisted them with that process and providing some pertinent and timely information related to those uh, changes in their elementary programming well done thank you uh, trustee gray Thank you very much. Just wanted to uh, offer a, a little bit of information from the Halton Marine Foundation. Um, yeah, it met earlier this week and uh, a member was added to the Board of Directors and the member is a former trustee in the Halton District School Board by the name of Cheryl Goldring, who is now a, a member of the uh, um, the Board of Directors. I wanted to just also share the date of May 30, which is the date that has been chosen for the annual golf tournament, which is again a fundraiser for the Halton Learning Foundation. And just a shout out to um, all of the employees in the Halton District School Board that information will soon be flowing uh, out with regards to how you can participate in the employee um, deduction program in support of the Halton Learning Foundation. Thank you very much. Trustee Oliver. Uh, thank you. Through you, Chair, to the uh, Director. Prior to the uh, start of the Burlington um, uh, review process, I had asked about tours of the um, secondary schools under review, well, all of them actually. So I'm just wondering um, if, there is a, if there are dates set for that, because I know you, that was arranged in December, but not all trustees could attend at a time. Through you, Chair Amos, to Trustee Oliver, we haven't set the date yet, but I, I will be uh, conducting those ones. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll get the dates out probably early next week to you. Not the tours early next week, the dates to you. Thank you. Trustee Danieli. Thank you, and I'm wondering if those uh, tours will happen in conjunction with the tours scheduled for the PAR committee, because I know that we are tentatively that uh, scheduled for February 7th and 8th to tour the schools. Through you, Chair Amos, to Trustee Danielli. No, I wasn't planning on doing so. I think they should be separate. Thank you. Trustee L. Harrison. Thank you very much. Just a quick question because I was slow uh, earlier on with an agenda item related to respectable workplace policy. And I just wondered whether um, in the posting of that, are our staff made aware of that and able to make comment or how does that work because that mostly relates to or in large part to staff um, general manager Taha thank you uh, chair Amos to trustee L Harrison uh, our approach with respect to um, uh, communicating this this policy this brand new policy that we uh, we are proposing to pass and that you've passed uh, was through the employee relations committees we've gone up to all of our unions communicated this policy and and some of the changes that uh, are linked to this policy in our admin procedures as a matter of fact we've also communicated the the broader respectful workplace initiative that we're about to undertake which is in line with the multi-year plan so that has been our approach thank you uh, uh I believe our federations, our unions were made aware of it too? Correct, through employee relations committees. Thank you. And seeing no further speakers, can I have a motion to adjourn? Trustee uh, L. Harrison, seconded by Trustee Oliver. All those in favor? And it's not even nine o'clock yet. <laughs> and that passed unanimously. Thank you very much. And we'll see you all next week. Kevin. <laughs>